Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India last lecture we had looked at the geometrical interpretation of the CFL condition. We will continue that discussion in this lecture. So, this is the diagram we drew to explain the domain of dependence in terms of the numerical scheme and in terms of the governing partial differential equation for the point P. The point P is important for us because that is the point at which we are trying to build up the solution at the next time step that is n plus 1 and at the spatial grid point i. So, how does that point P depend on values which are coming from earlier time steps and different spatial locations that is what we have explained through this diagram. And we explain for two different wave speeds which uh, can be accounted suitably or not accounted suitably by the numerical scheme in this diagram. So, we explain that a uh, wave which can have a comparatively smaller velocity a small is bounded by the numerical domain of dependence of point p and therefore, can be correctly resolved using this kind of a grid, grid in the sense both space and time grid. Because remember that finally, it is the CFL condition and CFL condition is a collective representation in terms of wave speed, in terms of time step as well as space step. So, as a combination whether they are satisfying the condition that C is less than equal to 1 as the upper bound is what matters that whether the numerical scheme can properly account for the physics which is involved which is essentially defined by the characteristic lines. So, for the a small wave we saw that the domain of dependence of the governing partial differential equation can be can be contained within the numerical domain of dependence while when the wave speed is larger the a large wave cannot be contained by the numerical domain of dependence. So, based on that we argued that the limiting case could be that when d x d t exactly conforms with the dashed red line that is the limiting case up to which the numerical scheme can handle. So, we discussed the condition a greater than 0 and we put our arguments together through the geometrical approach. What if a is less than 0? how would we tackle that situation. Let us look at the grid once more. So, we remember that along the x axis we have the spatial points along the y axis we have the temporal levels and now we are defining a characteristic line with a negative slope let us say minus a small. And then let us mark a few points here. So, last time we had a do, uh, dashed red line let us use red color here additionally we will create a green color dashed line on the other side because we will end up needing it later. And then let us mark a few important points as usual. So, P, C, Q, R and A. So, let us define these points. Now, 
if we were to continue with the backward differencing, let us see what happens. So, we will write down the backward difference formula once again, which worked as the upwind scheme when a was greater than 0. Now, this uses a stencil comprising of i and i minus 1 spatially. That means, the numerical domain of dependence will continue to be the same triangular region that we discussed P A C that is the numerical domain of dependence. That is the region from where it draws information for doing the calculations in order to calculate the values at point P. Does it work for this case? That is the question to ask. So, we see the domain of dependence of the governing PDE in this case. So, domain of for governing PDE is which region? It is PCQ. It is clear from the characteristic line that we have drawn that this is the region from where information will propagate to point P as far as the governing equation is concerned. Is it accounted or enveloped by the numerical domain of dependence? The answer is no. The numerical domain of dependence is looking at the other direction altogether. So, it is not looking at the upwind direction as far as A less than 0 situation is concerned. What happens? This scheme becomes unstable. So, which scheme would work? The schemes at least the, the ones that we have tried. Now, it is the forward differencing that we have tried which will work, because that is the scheme which can account for the physics consistently by looking at the proper, proper domain of dependence. And because the wave speed is small enough, it can also be bounded by that region. If the wave speed additionally was large, the wave was moving from right to left and it was large enough in comparison with the spatial and temporal grid that we have provided, like what we saw in the previous lecture where we defined A large then it would be difficult even with this scheme to give you a proper result. But as long as the wave speed is like what we have shown as A small, but this time with a negative sign, this scheme is actually going to consistently address the physics. So, in this context, this is the upwind scheme. So, we have the convenience of defining these schemes in a more general sense irrespective of which is the direction of the wave propagation. So, we do not have to call it forward differencing or backward differencing, we can in general say upwinding and then the scheme adapts based on what is the local direction of propagation of the wave. This is a more generalized framework. So, we understood that the backward scheme works for A greater than 0, the forward scheme works for A less than 0. There are a few more things we can do, which is going to help us understand the different aspects of our analysis better. So, we have been talking about complex expressions for the amplification factor. So, representing the amplification factor in complex plane, because till now we have just written down the expression for G. In order to get modulus of G, we have defined the complex conjugate, multiplied it with G to get modulus of G square and so on, but we have never thought about a geometrical representation of the amplification factor. So, 
Let us try to draw, draw the axis in complex plane. So, this is real G, this is the imaginary part of G and we can pick up the amplification factor, let us say for A greater than 0 for the forward time backward space scheme, the expression for G will be used here. So, the expression of G is 1 plus uh, or other we will put it slightly differently, we will put it as 1 minus C plus C cos theta plus I times minus C sin theta. And if you watch the expression for G very carefully, you can figure out that there is a parametric equation of a circle hiding here in the expression for G, because you may remember that an expression like x is equal to r cos theta, y is equal to y uh, say r sin theta can satisfy the equation of a circle x square plus y square is equal to r square. So, taking a clue from there, which we have done in our uh, plus 2 coordinate geometry. We also remember that these two portions of the G expression, this is the real part of G, this is the imaginary part of G, these are like the two coordinates. And in the x coordinate sense, there is an offsetting of the origin by an amount 1 minus c. So, if you did not have this offsetting, then the coordinates of the center of this circle would have lied at 0, 0. But because you have a non-zero value there and that corresponds to the real axis, you will have a shifting of the center of the circle along the real axis. So, taking these clues you could try representing it here in the complex plane and you will find that in the complex plane you will have a representation looking like this. You essentially have two circles one with radius unity, another the smaller one with radius c and the center of this smaller circle is offset by an amount 1 minus c. That is essentially the representation of G in complex plane. So, as c grows, what happens is the value of 1 minus c will become smaller uh, and smaller and in the limit as c approaches 1, 1 minus c will tend to 0 and this small circle will limit towards the large circle with radius unity. As long as it c is not, c does not exceed the value of 1 you can lie within the large circle or at most merge with the large circle. Even if you merge with the large circle, there is no issue because in that case modulus g will be equal to 1, which is still stable. But if you exceed that, then you will end up having instability in the calculation. So, that was what we learned from the CFL condition that the CFL number needs to be restricted to 1, it should not go beyond 1. And this is the way you tell the story through geometrical means by representing it in the complex plane. So, this is the representation of amplification factor in the complex plane. 
So, this is something that we did not look at since we were looking at the geometric representation of the CFL condition which we did with uh, the spatial and temporal grids earlier. This is another geometric representation which may be of interest. There is another way we can look at the amplification factor. We will express it in exponential form. when it turns out to be a complex number. So, let us see how we do it. We will express the amplification factor g as a product of its modulus and an exponential term, which we will define as e to the power of i phi. Of course, i is under root minus 1. So, how do we define phi? Of course, modulus of g is already known to us. So, we take the real part of g, square it, add it to the imaginary part of g and if you take under root, you will get mod g. How about the angle phi? That comes from the tan inverse of the imaginary part of g. divided by the real part of g. Of course, if you wish you could put brackets here. So, this is how we can express the amplification factor in, the, in an exponential form for representing a complex number or a complex expression for g. And let us say if you are to do it for the first order upwind scheme, then this will come out to be as far as mod g is concerned, we have already shown the expression earlier for first order upwind scheme. So, we are not repeating here. So, additionally we have the definition phi here. So, essentially this gives us information about amplitude and this gives us information about the phase. So, we may put it this way that for the exact equation, we will have a certain definition for the amplitude, we will have a certain definition for the phase and then for any given numerical discretization, we can have a definition for its amplitude and its phase. So, if we compare amplitudes between the exact scheme and a particular numerical discretization, we can see whether we are getting amplitude errors. If we are comparing between the phase expression for an exact scheme and the phase expression for a numerical discretization, we will get whether there are any phase wise errors which are committed. So, how would it matter? It would matter enormously as to how we capture the wave propagation. So, as we capture the movement of the wave, if the numerical scheme is artificially dissipating it, then the amplitudes will decay. If the numerical scheme is creating some phase errors, then the wave will get distorted. There would be certain wiggles which would be formed. We will talk more about it later, but there would be phase distortions in the wave and therefore, the wave might show existence of certain oscillations. So, these errors would have to be minimized and that is done through more advanced numerical schemes, but the target should always be to first of all quantify them and then try to minimize them. Now, since we discussed about possible comparison of a numerical schemes performance with uh, the exact solution, then we need to have a basis on which we compare. So, let us try to 
write down the phase angle for exact solution of wave equation. We are not concerned much about the amplitude because linear wave equation by definition will not attenuate the amplitude of the wave that you define at t equal to 0. It will propagate unattenuated through the domain with wave speed a by definition. So, the main thing that we need to be concerned about is how we end up defining the phase angle for the exact solution, because that would be the basis for comparing the phase angle as per the numerical scheme and we need to see whether there is a gap between the two. And as far as the modulus of g is concerned, we know modulus of g for the exact scheme will definitely be 1. So, we only need to care about the modulus of the numerical scheme and then that gives you the difference, the gap. So, to begin with, we propose a form for the dependent variable u and going by our experience of doing the von Neumann stability analysis, we begin with a, a proposal of this kind that there would have, be, have to be an amplitude part and a phase part, because we are drawing from our experience that when we did it for discrete terms, we did it this way. So, only thing that we have done is that instead of writing it as delta x into i, we have written it as x here and now we need to think that whether we will keep the u n term as it is, but it turns out that we can replace it with an exponential term, because that will give us a more convenient form to work with. By the way, this should be capital I, because that is what represents under root minus 1 while i here is the grid index. So, this should be capital I as well. So, we are proposing an alternative form for u n with an unknown parameter m, but of course, it, it has to be multiplied with the time instant t, so that we can show the dependence of that term u n on the time. So, if you propose a form for u like this and you go about substituting that form in the governing partial differential equation, can you work out the value of m which is showing up in the index in terms of the other known parameters? Let us try to do that. So, if you substitute that form in the partial derivative u t, then it comes out to be this, which is nothing but m times u itself and then you work out u x. You need these because you have to substitute it in the governing partial differential equation. So, if you take a partial derivative with respect to x, you will get i times k which is coming from here and this, this m s is essentially came from there. So, when you do u x, you get i k times e to the power of m t times e to the power of i k x. So, that is nothing but i times k times u. So, if you substitute these two into the governing partial differential equation, what do you get? You will get m into u plus a i k u is equal to 0, which means m is equal to minus a k times i. If you substitute it back into the original equation, you will get minus i times a k t into e to the power of i k x so
So, if you just club the terms together you get i k x minus a t. So, that that is the form for u. This is the exact form of u. And in any numerical discretization, this is not exactly going to be how u behaves, there will be a difference. We need to quantify what that difference works out to be in terms of the amplitude and in terms of the phase. So, if you were to look at the exact amplification factor. So, that g exact let us say it is u at t plus delta t and divided by u t. Remember that for a discretized case we do it as u n plus 1 by u n. Here we are doing it as a ratio of u at two different time instants separated by a small interval delta t. this is how it works out and as you can figure out the exponent in the numerator can be worked out like this. So, that way one of the terms in the numerator will get cancelled with one term with the term in the denominator. So, leaving behind only one term. So, that is e to the power of minus i k a delta t. So, we can write this as say g exact is say 1 into e to the power of i phi exact. Now, 1 in the sense that this is modulus of g exact because you did not have any number other than 1 here as a coefficient of the exponential term and remember that this what is the basis of this we had defined g to be equal to mod g into e to the power of i phi. So, that mod g here comes out to be 1. What have you got for the phi exact? That is nothing but k a delta t and then that can be written as minus k c delta x, c being equal to a delta t by delta x and we remember that k delta x again is phase angle theta in the wave number space. So, that is minus c theta. So, 5 exact is equal to minus c times theta. So, now is the time when we can compare between the exact and the numerical scheme. So, if we say that there are two errors, two sources of errors, then we would say that there is an amplitude error which is often called as dissipation error because if your mod g is too far below 1, then on repeated application of mod g over time steps, the wave amplitude can come down 
with time. How it applies is like this that if you have a wave amplitude say A naught at t equal to 0 when you are setting the initial waveform. Then at the first time step what will happen to the amplitude is that A naught will be multiplied by mod g that will be the new amplitude. What will happen to the amplitude at the second time step? You are now starting with a reduced amplitude already which comes from the first time step to that the mod g will again get applied in the second time step and therefore, it will become a naught into mod g square and so on. So, at the end of say nth time steps what will be the wave amplitude? It is nothing but a naught mod g to the power of n. So, you can imagine that if mod g happens to be a number close enough to 1, but by repeated application of that mod g step by step, step by step, let us say at the end of 100 time steps this would not remain very close to 1 anymore. That means, when you are computing for a long enough time in order to ensure that the wave goes through the numerical domain entirely, it starts somewhere and it ends somewhere in the sense that it has come into the domain at some point and it has traversed through the domain at wave speed a and is moving out of the domain. So, it takes a number of time steps to do that. So, as it does, it is also getting attenuated and that is not a good message. So, you need to remain as close as possible to 1, so that you are not getting sufficiently attenuated. Typically, if you are able to maintain mod g equal to 1, that is the best scenario. That is the way you ensure that amplitude wise you match the exact solution. If you do, then you then bother. Uh, that how good are you doing in terms of phase error. So, this is the amplitude issue. So, if you were to quantify the error between exact and uh, exact and the numerical, you can say that this is the diffusion error. So, E for error and the subscript D i f for diffusion. So, one can define it like this say 1 minus mod of g and that too it is numerical scheme. So, g numerical raised to the power of n into a naught. So, that would be the diffusion uh, uh, let let us uh, sorry. So, this should be dissipation I am sorry. So, let us write it completely. So, this is the dissipation error. So, as we said that there could be also phase error. So, what is the phase error? So, phase error is essentially the phi exact minus the phi numerical that is what you are committing at every time step. Incidentally, this is incremental phase shifting that is happening every time step. That means, in one time step it is this, in the subsequent time step it is two times this, it gets summed up. So, dissipation error is like a particular factor getting multiplied over and over again as time steps elapse, where as phase error gets summed up. So, if there is a phase shifting, let us say you have a wave like this which is exact and initially the numerical result also looks like this, 
but in the next time step the numerical wave goes ahead of the exact wave. So, there is a certain amount of phase error that you have committed. So, this would be the phi exact minus phi numerical let us say. And then in the subsequent time step you notice that this has become more say 2 times of what happened in one time step and so on. So, the phase error will keep accruing like that while the dissipation error is of a different kind. So, if this is the exact one and the numerical one also matches it initially in the first time step if there is a reduction in amplitude of this kind in the second time step the reduction may be more and so on. This way the wave gets dissipated. So, this is like an amplitude error while this is a phase error. This is how things show up. So, just trying to complete on the phase error part we would say that because of the phase error there is something called as dispersion of the wave and that dispersion over n time steps can be quantified as the difference between the phi for the exact and the phi for the numerical in one time step multiplied by the number of time steps. So, that gives you an idea about the kind of errors which could be committed in course of the numerical computations. We will discuss more on this in the next lecture. Thank you.